For those of you who do not know uh, Dr. Jean Barbeau, he is an associate professor in the Department of Medicine and the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics and Occupational Health at McGill University. He serves as the director of the Respiratory uh, Epidemiology and Clinical Research Unit and the Pulmonary Rehabilitation Unit at the Montreal Chest Institute of McGill University Health Center. Don't scream too loud, but please help me welcome Dr. Bravo. <laughs> Look like the timing is good, and that I've, I've missed something at lunchtime. <laughs> then, um, thank, thank you very much. I, I, I think there is an update that has to be done on my CV. Okay, I'm a professor at McGill. Uh, um, I used to be associate professor. Okay, then uh, now it seems that I, I cannot go uh, any higher than uh, than that. Okay, before next step is retirement. <laughs> then it. Then I, I, I see that it looks like there is a competition between this room and the other room, by the way. Uh, <coughs> I think we can do better than the other room. <laughs> hey! I knew that, yeah. <laughs> I, I'd like to thank the Alpha One the, the Foundation for, uh, the first of all, having this, uh, this event uh, here in, the, in Montreal and um, giving the opportunity to, uh, to everyone to uh, have occupation from uh, across the country, a uh, healthcare professional. And um, this, is a, this is a privilege, okay? We, we see patients one at a time in our clinic to be able okay, to uh, just sit down, relax, have the whole day, and have a chance also to uh, to talk. I promise I'll be here the rest of the afternoon. I have a resident covering for me. Okay, I have to go back because I'm on call. Then uh, I'll be very happy to uh, uh, to take the question after the question period. Also, I'll be at the coffee break as well. Donc merci à tout uh, la, la fondation tout particulièrement. Euh, aux gens qui se sont déplacés de, de l'extérieur, mais euh, bien entendu les gens du Québec et euh, de Montréal. Donc, as you, you can hear, okay, I'm going to do the talk in English. Uh, I hope the translation system works well and, uh, you know, my accent, okay, will, will not prevent the translator. I'm sure they have seen and they have heard worse than, than, than now. What I'd like to do is uh, it's go over with you, um, not so much in, in the detail, but more, okay, there's going to be questions. Um, you probably know the answer to these questions. Um, we're going to try to understand why the response to these questions sometimes are quite unsatisfactory. And... Um, what is going on with the guideline? There is improvement that can be done on the guideline, and I'm going to comment on that. Uh, but even what has been recommended in the uh, guideline as of 2012, the Canadian guideline from the Canadian Thoracic Society, are we doing the job? Okay, and I, I think we all need the help of each other to either understand, but as well, to do better. As, uh, as Dr. Chapman, uh, that we, uh, we have disclosure, uh, I'm uh, more in the field of COPD. It's only recently in the last few years that I have I've started to get to uh, devoted more time and interest in the, in the Alpha One. Okay? It took me that long okay, to, to realize um, how much okay, this disease need, okay, and uh, taking care of COPD patient for all these years uh, that we, we didn't pay the proper attention to Alpha One, I, I felt that there's, I had a lot of rattrapage to do. I really had to work hard, okay, and speed up on, on this. Let's start with the first question. Well, you know about Alpha One then um, I'm sure a lot of you are going to be able to answer that question. Uh, with, okay, for, is it a rare disease? Yeah. 
That's interesting. Not sure I get this right, but anyway, what is this? Is it okay for me in the back? Yeah, okay. Um, then it's interesting because we have to think about it. And then some of us are going to say, yeah, it's a rare disease. Others are going to say, no, it's not a rare disease. And maybe we should depend on the definition of what is a rare, a rare disease. It's, it's always good to refer ourselves, and we're not going to spend the rest of the afternoon on definition. I, I don't worry with, with that. You know. There's nothing worse than having a bunch of experts sitting around the table and trying to define, trying to define something. You've, uh, you probably haven't seen that. We're going to spend the whole day. And at the end, it's probably going to be the worst definition that you haven't seen. It's not a rare disease. And I'm going to show you that by example, reference of disease that you know. When we look at idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, you heard about that one. We hear more about that one recently. Of the rare disease, this is the most common one. But it's not a rare disease anymore. And if we look at the disease, okay, such as cystic fibrosis, what do you think of cystic fibrosis? Okay, if it's a rare disease, we talk a lot about cystic fibrosis. There is a lot of money in research of cystic fibrosis. And look at cystic fibrosis as compared to alpha-1 antitrypsin. Then one of the 6,000 Canadian are estimated to have a PIZZ, one out of 9,000 in the USA and 5,000 in Europe. I think if we want to help our cause, we have to start, okay, to compare these numbers and try to convince people around that this is not, this is not rare. And you know that it's the only genetic disease as a risk, O's risk, that we know in COPD. And until someone finds something better than that, that's the most common O's factor genetic that we know in COPD. Then to me, that's the most common one. That's pretty common. Then, what about the diagnosis of this disease? Oh my gosh. We're getting from worse to much worse, I, I think, here. That's not true, okay? The problem, okay, if we look at the diagnosis of this disease is that only 5% of the individual are diagnosed. And then there is a delay of eight years. This is pretty, pretty bad. And that's one of the problems. I'm seeing patients that are referred to me. They're ready for the lung transplant. And the question of having a treatment with prolastin is, is already, it's already too late. They've passed that stage. And they've been seen for a year and follow by physician, then we're definitively missing something here. And if we look now at why is it important to make an early diagnosis of the disease, is it important? Yes, it is important. It is important to improve patient outcome. And there are different ways of improving patient outcome. Dr. Chapman has already discussed that, at least in part with you. We have to uh, spend more time with the patient. Smoking is not good to start. And everyone should be advised not to smoke and should be helped to stop to smoke. But if you know you have okay, a ZZ and then therefore you're at risk, then obviously you're going to have to spend and you want to know about that. You're going to have to spend more time. The same thing at work. What kind of work are you doing? But then having the proper treatment, symptomatic treatment that Dr. Chapman gave review with you this morning, and then 
non-pharmacology treatment also, such as pulmonary rehab. This is good in any COPD patient. We don't spend much time. None of these treatments are going to change the course of the disease except smoking cessation and having access to augmentation therapy. And we want to preserve the lung function. Let's go now to the guideline. Guideline is, are written to guide, to guide the healthcare professional in a better way of taking decision. Guidelines are usually done these days very, very meticulously with rules that are extremely strict where you use data that you have and you establish from these data what is or what are the evidence. And you give a level of evidence based on the quality of these data. And until recently, we were in lack of data. But when we look very carefully, and this is what the 2012 Canadian Thoracic Society guideline has done, we had enough data to be able to make recommendation. And that's what we're gonna review. But then we're gonna try to see now from these recommendations, what is going on in Canada? And are we applying these guides? Because one of the problems in guideline is the implementation for different reasons. Maybe there are too many guidelines. Maybe some of the guidelines are really not practical. Maybe the family physician has too many guidelines because he's not only treating lung condition. And when he's treating lung condition, is not only treating COPD, then how can we change, increase awareness at least that there is a minimum that need to be done? Need to be done in the testing and need to be done in the treatment. Let's see what the recommendations are with the testing. And there was, that guideline is very simple, two questions that the guideline was trying to answer. The first question was, which population are more appropriate for targeted testing of alpha-1 level to improve case finding a patient at risk of or with documented lung disease? We were not even looking at counseling here. We're not talking here of a large-scale screening we're talking of case finding. That means that under which rule we should identify group of individuals that are at risk and test these individuals. And is there evidence of those individuals that are at risk, therefore we should make recommendation based on these evidence. This is quite an important step. When we look at the review that has been done, we were able to recommend, suggest, targeted testing be considered an individual with COPD before the age of 65 or with a smoking history than less than 20 pack year. This is not a very high grade of recommendation, and that's why we suggest we're not recommending. When it's a very high grade, such as one, we don't use the term suggest, we use the term recommend. But until we get better than that, this is pretty simple. That's mean that you test on almost every COPD patient. Is it done? In most, if not all, my patients that are referred in the COPD clinic, they don't have an alpha-1 done. We're doing it systematically now. Then I guess that unless we change the way that test become, and it's not 
it's not an expensive test and it's very easy to do. But in most of the patients, the test is not done despite the recommendation. And maybe you have the solution to that and this is something we can discuss. And that was based essentially on the two study, one case control study and okay, another a family based study okay, where you, okay, you can see here okay, that for the group of less than 20 pack year, okay, there was okay, clearly uh, differences okay, on okay, finding okay, emphysema in the MZ as compared okay, to the MM. Let's start now with a the case. There is nothing better than trying to remember or trying to ask ourselves and understand better, in practice, are we doing what we should be doing? We have a woman here, smoker, referred to the COPD clinic for respiratory condition. The question here is about asthma and COPD. Uh, because, okay, there, is, uh, there are some reversibility on the pulmonary function tests that are more than what we would expect and almost a normalization of the lung function test in the first place when the patient was assessed. She has a sister in the USA and that sister is already on oxygen and she's already on augmentation therapy. You can see the investigation from 2008 Okay, where at the beginning, there was an improvement of what we call the forced expiratory volume in one second, which is one of the most important, the FEV1, that they are used a lot in study, and they're used a lot in the clinical setting. And, and based on that reversibility, as, as you can see, then okay, the component of asthma was considered to be something on probably the top of the COPD, and therefore, and she was started on LABA and, and ICS. There was then work on the smoking counseling. The patient was still smoking at the, at the time. And the CD scan was showing lower lobe emphysema. And, and that's one of the problem of that disease also, is that we're gonna see what are the recommendation for the augmentation therapy, but the recommendation are still based on the FEV1. Therefore, when there is a disconnection between the FEV1 and the loss of, of tissue mass, it's not something that is always for a given patient. There is a lot of heterogeneity. When you take an old population, the FEV1 on average is going to be low and the emphysema is likely to be more important. But for a given patient, we do have patients that have emphysema, some that it could be quite significant, and the FEV1 is not going to be affected in a major way. That will then give quite a problem because we underestimate the disease in the many of our patients. Therefore, the patient that has a low FEV1 is more likely to be treated than the patient who doesn't have a low FEV1 but may still have emphysema or even more emphysema than some patients that have a low FEV1. Then here, okay, we uh, confirm that this patient had COPD. There was a component of asthma and we showed that the alpha-1 antitrypsin was quite low and the genotyping was as easy. We're going to come back to the treatment later on. What about the, the testing? The family member should be tested as well. The process map and diagnosis algorithm should encourage appropriate awareness of testing and follow-up. And in Quebec, we have a very nice algorithm here. To help the physician, this algorithm has been disseminated where there are steps that are recommended to be taken and okay, to be sent 
where certain lab in Quebec and in Canada have been designated from the alpha one level to move on to phenotyping or genotyping and different type of testing and this is done okay through these a uh, different lab there are issue of delay there are issue of understanding for the physician what it mean and when we look okay at the result why do we determine to a level here because there is a level here that is for the protective level and there is a level here that is more for confirming the need of further tests. But there are still very few physicians who understand the meaning of that and the need okay, for further either referring the patient or having the test moving to uh, genotyping. I think the solution is going to have center like we have with cystic fibrosis where you refer the patient and get to these center and okay, these center have the proper team and qualification from nursing, respiratory therapist, physician to take care of these patients and the right decision and therefore the patient after can go back to the treating physician and the more severe patient would likely be follow okay, through that specialized clinic. And over time, we can probably build more education okay, across the provinces, in family medicine, and even with our colleague respirologists. But it is clear right now that the testing is not done. Even if we have defined from the guideline who are the population at risk, and we have suggested in which population the test should be done. Could we go with a test that is going to be more simplified? We are entering a study now that we just uh, going to receive a grant where from a population study in Canada, we are going to do a testing from okay, what we call okay, gene okay, sequencing. Then we're going to do the genome of okay, all the patients from these study. Like what was a, a very expensive test, genetic tests were very expensive now, is becoming something much more accessible. And through that study, we hope that we're going to be able to show either okay, new mutation that might be associated with an expression of the disease and some patient that we are not treating right now, and maybe change the way that the testing is done, where instead of going through different steps, we could go directly okay, to the identification okay, of the gene or the lack of the gene, and that way we can even assess all the mutations that are present. We are not yet there, although in terms of cost, this is something that could be done in the near future. We have to build the data and show that that way is more practical and that way is more also cost effective. What about now, what do we know about the outcome and the pronostic in patient? Symptoms are specific. What do you think? Symptoms of uh, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, emphysema, are specific? Are they different than the symptoms of COPD in general? They're not. They may even be similar to some asthmatic patient, and that's why some physician, and it's not always easy to make the distinction between asthma and COPD. And a lot of the symptoms can be found in any chronic respiratory disease, even like idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. The alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency often result in the development of several nonspecific symptoms easily confused with 
other respiratory disease, and in particular, COPD. What about the decline in FEV1? Is it accelerated in patients with alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency? It is, yes. Compared with the general population, it have an accelerated decline in the lung function. And there is an increased risk in patients that are symptomatic of morbidity and reduced life expectancy. Then how come we have such a hard time to give to this disease the importance that it has? When you start to talk about the disease where there are morbidity, where you reduce the life expectancy, then e everyone give the right attention to that disease. That disease can be diabetes. That disease can be cardiovascular disease. That disease can be cancer. How do we have to spell this disease to have the proper attention? How come it's different with this disease? We're not giving the attention that it deserves where we have the data to show that when patients are symptomatic, it increases morbidity and reduce lifespan. When we look at augmentation therapy, and Dr. Chapman mentioned some of this this morning, we know that it, pr it provides in addition to optimal therapy for COPD, and that's one condition. We have to optimize the treatment like we do with any COPD patient and it should be given in addition. A specific treatment with weekly intravenous infusion, although this may change in the way that this is administered now, there may be new way of this being administered in the future, way that are gonna be more practical, way that might ensure that the level is gonna be maintained a higher where f there you might expect more benefit than what has been already showed in some, some study. It has been shown since 30 years okay, that okay, this is the biochemical efficacy has really been demonstrated. What we had struggled all these years is the efficacy in terms of lung function, in terms of symptoms, exacerbation. And we also know that it's safe. And the cost, let's talk about the cost. $100,000 a year. This is very expensive. Five years ago, when you were trying to find treatment that were that expensive, because that's often the reason that it's given by colleague respirologist, $100,000 a year, that's too expensive. Who I am to decide that this is too expensive to maintain a life, to prevent lung transplant, and what is the option for some patient? For many patients, the option is zero. For those that are young enough, the option may be lung transplant. And for most of the patient, it's dying prematurely without receiving the treatment. Let's put ourselves in 2016. Do you know any treatment that costs $50,000 a year and more? Yeah. Yeah, for two weeks, for four weeks. Then a lot of our decisions are very emotional. And, and I'm not saying we're, this, is not, this is not a competition between disease. But a lot of the decisions are not rational. They're very emotional. And when they have group of people that are very vocal, then things move much faster. This is HIV. Sure, the third world country, it's a huge disaster. But if you look at what happened 
in the developed country, that disease has changed completely in the last 20 years. Cancer, lung fibrosis, those treatments are extremely expensive a year. $50,000 a year and more. There are two antifibrotic treatments now for idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. In the state, it's $90,000 US, these treatments a year, for an improvement of the vital capacity of 100, 150, to prevent the deterioration of the vital capacity of 100, 150 cc. And in at least 50% of the patient, it doesn't work. Cystic fibrosis, someone has mentioned that. They win. The new treatment, combination treatment, for those, okay, that are response, okay, and they have the right, okay, receptor, $350,000 a year for a lifetime. Have you seen the result of this study? I saw the result of the study. And I'm telling you, that's not that impressive. But why do you think this treatment is covered? I'm going to give you the example of Quebec. It's covered in Quebec. You know, prolastin is also covered. In the first year, just in my institution, there are 20 patients with cystic fibrosis that are on that treatment. How many patients do we have in Quebec okay, on augmentation therapy in the last 10 years? <laughs> yeah, then, then I don't think the cost by itself should be a reason. Do you have the evidence that this is effective? That's the first question that we have to ask ourselves. The guideline that was done in 2012, and we didn't have the rapid study at the time, and I think we should now have an update of that guideline and add that study. But when okay, we ask the question about augmentation being effective in patients that have ZZ, and this is the recommendation that came from our review, we suggest augmentation therapy Okay, to be considered, and we look at the look at the way it's been written. And when I read that, I'm 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 almost sick. May be considered. Gosh, and there was in the group people who didn't agree with that, and we have to indicate that we didn't have the consent, we didn't have the everyone agreeing on the recommendation. There was a consensus but it was not 100% of the people that were expert on this committee that agree with this recommendation. That we had to sort of soft the recommendation. Not only say that we suggest, but maybe peut-être, okay, consider. Then we say that it has to be done in non-smoker, ex-smoker, with COPD, and we have the level here, and this is based on evidence. It's based mainly on registry between 25 and 80 percent FEV1 predicted, attributable to emphysema, and we have a good documentation of the level being low, who are receiving optimal pharmacology and non-pharmacology treatment. And this is based at the time, okay, on study that were done. There was two randomized clinical trials assessing the density of the lung. Because over the year, and that was explained to you this morning, there is no way that we can do a study with FEV1 and have the right number of patients. These study, and I'm going to show you that they've been negative. Then when you have a study that is negative, the first question you have to ask yourself did I have the number of patients right that I put myself in a condition where if the result of the study is negative, I can be confident enough that this is a real negative and it's not a false negative, that this treatment is effective, but then I don't have enough patients to show that it is effective. And that's the problem 
of the trial that have been done assessing FEV1 has an outcome, the number are too small. And it's impossible to do a trial with thousands of patients. Then we also use two non-randomized observational study that are coming okay, from two large registry. One that is okay, a German registry and the largest registry, okay, which is the NHLBI, the American registry. And if you look at the CT scan lung density, already at that time when you pull the result of the two study, and there was good reason and justification to pull the result, there was, we were able to show okay, that okay, there was a differences, and that's what this graph show you in terms of the change in the density Then patients that were treated, you see that the, the progression okay, was quite different in the dark bar than the light bar that was the placebo group. When we look at the registry here, and you can see okay, in red, Okay, that the group with an FEV1 of 35% and 49% of predicted on augmentation therapy, the long function decline was not as accelerated than those that were not treated. The problem with registry is different than you don't have the same quality than when you do a randomized clinical trial. When you do a randomized clinical trial, that's the best design to show the intervention efficacy because you take people that have the same characteristic and randomly you don't choose based on your conviction you don't choose based on the patient conviction you randomly decide that one patient is going to go on one treatment or the other and the treatment is given blindly as well another registry here showed that there was a difference with a patient that had FEV1 between 31% and 65% of predicted. And this is where the recommendations are coming from. When you look at the other outcome, the problem is that either, for example, exacerbation and quality of life, you have no evidence of benefit, but I would say this is more lack of evidence, lack of data here. Then we're okay, up here with mortality where there is a benefit in augmentation therapy and those are coming from registry. This is why this is a grade C and not a grade A. Lung function, this is a grade B for the randomized clinical trial, but it's negative. The randomized clinical trial have not showed an improvement, but I mentioned before why this is, is because the number is too small. When you look at the registry, there is a benefit, and this is a grade C. And when you look at CT scan lung density, this is a grade B. And probably if we were doing the review again and adding the new study, the rapid trial, that would become a grade A. Because now we would have from one study, and we would have from two previous studies, the same result, therefore you can show consistency in the result, either pooling or from only one study okay, that show that it is effective. Lung density is now accepted by the FDA has been an outcome. And we know that lung density also relate with patient reported outcome, such as exacerbation, symptoms, quality of life, and FEV1 also then there is sufficient data now to say that we have evidence that augmentation therapy is effective. And the recommendation done by the Canadian guideline in 2012, therefore, should be reinforced at this point in time. I'm gonna finish with case presentation. This is a man of 43 year old. He's been followed for COPD. He had a diagnosis of uh, ZZ okay, deficiency in alpha-1 in 1993. He stopped smoking in 1992. Look at his fluoride, 
1.76. What are we doing here? Is spirometry a treatment? Then DLCO, 78%, 72%, 49%, 29%. This is an agony to me. When I look at following these numbers, and okay, the CD scan panlobular emphysema in 1993. He was referred to our clinic 2013, then started on augmentation therapy. He was evaluated in 2014 and had lung transplantation. The, uh, you know, send the patient for a lung transplantation. During all these years, this patient or someone has watched the lung function going down, going down, going down. The same patient from before, okay, over time she stopped smoking. She uh, was complaining of dyspnea, um, increased the dyspnea over okay, the last year, despite okay, the, the ICS LABA, and the, we added the LAMA, another bronchodilator, and, and then recently we investigated her because she was complaining of being more short of breath. And uh, yeah, a lot of doctors would have say simply, you know, yeah, you know, that's normal. Uh, you, have, uh, you have COPD, uh, you have asthma. It, it wasn't clear from the flow rate that there were a lot of change. Look at the FEV1. The FEV1 is still 84% of predicted. The CD scan showed the moderate Okay, lower lobe emphysema, but because in clinic we don't use the quantitative methods, it's still qualitative, it, it wasn't clear that there were a lot of change from the CT scan. And we could have stopped there. We did an exercise test, and we found out that this patient was right. Because on the exercise test, okay, do, although we didn't have one to compare with, and that's that's a mistake. We should have done an exercise test in the first place. But it was clear from that exercise test okay, that the patient had a ventilatory limitation and also she has O2 desaturation. Then in retrospective, okay, I don't think we would have been able to start the treatment earlier on with an FEV1 like she had. But then we were, okay, this is really someone okay, that he had to be started on augmentation therapy. This case is to show that it's not always easy to, to decide when. It's some case it's very clear. Other case, it's not so easy to decide when. And when you decide that it's time, in retrospective, you, you may say to yourself, mm, maybe I should have started earlier on. What, okay, what should we emphasize now? Even physicians who are aware of alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency may be hesitant to make a diagnosis and even more hesitant to treat. There are too much delay okay, in the augmentation therapy. And people be still believe that it's too complicated and it's too costly. You know, I've always asked myself as a physician, do I find it's too complicated for myself or for the patient? If it's for myself, then I have to build a system or refer to a group of physicians or a center that are going to do it for me. If it's too complicated for me to do counseling and smoking cessation, what I'm going to do? I'm going to say, this is not my business? No. I'm going to refer the patient to a smoking cessation center, and there are many across the country. But the same thing here. If it's too complicated for the patient, I think I should ask my patient. It's not up to me to decide what is complicated or not complicated. It's my patient, and I should ask him and give him the information, non-judgmental and non-biased. Obviously, there is a way to make a patient say no. 
We, we all know how to do that as physician. The only option for disease modification therapy right now beyond augmentation therapy is lung transplant. That's a sad story. We're lucky to have lung transplant, but the bottom line is that you don't want to get there. You want to prevent the lung destruction such that you won't need a lung transplant. Diagnosis is now accessible. You do it, the physician can do it, and smoking cessation. Then patient can be referred now to alpha-1 antitrypsin clinic. There are many centers in Canada that do have interest and devoted time to these patients. They are in Quebec as well. They're very well known that we're trying now to increase awareness by talk to physician, to ally professional, and make sure, okay, that we can help those physicians family physician, respirologist, okay, to take better care of these patients by testing and by offering the best uh, optimal treatment. Thank you. Oh, hello. Do we have any questions? Any questions? Ceux qui veulent poser les questions en français, vous êtes les bienvenus. Euh, et ça me fera plaisir de traduire la question et de donner la réponse en français et en anglais. And those who want to ask the question Excuse in French, you're very welcome. I'm going to translate in English and I'm going to give the answer in English and French. Question over here. Excuse me. Uh, you said there were clinic in Quebec. Where? They are through the COPD clinic. There is one at the Montreal Jess Institute that has been built now through the COPD clinic. Uh, the SHIM also through the COPD clinic. Uh, and there is one in uh, Quebec City also at the Institut de Cardiologie et de Pneumologie de l'Université Laval, again through the COPD. Yeah, but could my doctor refer me to them? Yeah, you, could don't, you, you can be referred by your doctor uh, or you can be referred by any doctor. Okay, to, well, I'm uh, already followed by a lung specialist. Yeah. I do. I, I'm, I'm going to be I've honest been, with I'll you. I do have more and more, and, and, and some of the nurses that work in the COPD clinic are, are here. Uh, Isabelle, who is here, Isabelle Drouin, and Isabelle Wallet, who is in the back. And uh, I have to say that we, we have more and more referral now by, uh, by respirologists. Therefore, uh, the respirologists feel that uh, either they need a second opinion or it, 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 is, a it, it is much more work, I have, to, I have to say, that you really need a team in place to help you. And that's what we have as part of a COPD clinic, really dedicated uh, nurses, respiratory therapists, and an old team in Pune Rehab as well. Then, then you can be referred. And we do have uh, more and more of these patients from respirologists in Montreal and outside Montreal that are referred to us. And the reason why in Quebec, but that I'm curious so, so hard to, 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 be, to be put on prolastin? The re sorry? I, the why is it so hard? Because of RAMQ, that they accept the treatment. I, I wouldn't I've been refused already. Yeah, I, I, don't I, wouldn't blame, I wouldn't blame the RAMQ. I think, you know, uh, I can blame the RAMQ for many other things. But I'm, I'm going to try to be very objective here. In Quebec right now, it is covered. I, I don't know for how long it's, it's, it's going to be covered. Uh, it may change in the future in the way that, and usually the way that it, it changed, I doubt that the RAMQ would stop without asking, the Ministry of Health may ask, the Association des Pneumologues de la province de Québec, to make recommendation if at some point they feel that it's, 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 the number is going up. That's for sure, I know. Just looking from my clinic, the number we have now, and we, we keep having more and more patients. But until now, the RAMQ has been uh, paying for, for it, but they're gonna follow the rules that have been established by society. And as of now, they have followed 
okay, the recommendation of the Canadian Thoracic Society. At some point, what they have done with other treatment, they may decided to ask at a provincial level, l'Association des Pneumologues de la province de Québec, and ask, would you make recommendation that or the, they make a, an expert committee that will give recommendation. But where, as it is now, I can tell you, I'm not saying it's easy, but at least you have the possibility. But if you don't fulfill the criteria, then it may be more complicated. And this is something obviously that need a second opinion. We need to look in the detail of it. Can we still make a case at the RAMQ okay, to have uh, the augmentation therapy? I'm not saying that it is impossible but it's obviously going to be more difficult. Excuse me. But it's different in, any pro in every province. Is that, you know, people in the room here and people from the foundation know that, know that very well, how difficult it is. And some provinces don't, don't, don't cover by the public uh, uh, insurance regime in, anymore. Uh, yes, the question I have is that I'm aware of some respirologists are giving uh, oxygen as sort of um, oxygen at night or oxygen for exercise. Now, is it, are there any recommendations on that uh, in the guidelines? Okay, the guideline here was not, was not on oxygen therapy. The guideline was essentially on alpha-1 antitrypsin. And the guideline was essentially answering two questions. And the, I've presented you yeah. the question, one about testing and one about uh, uh, augmentation therapy. And, and that's the, I'm going to answer your question yeah. anyway. But that's <laughs> the limitation of a guideline. Yeah. Because now the way we do guideline is you, you, you decide based on a review. And in fact, we should involve patients in our question that we decide that the even the new way of doing guideline now is that you you engage patient from the beginning and even in the question you decide to address in the guideline you we are starting now to involve the patient having said that there are okay guideline and recommendation on the oxygen therapy in copd uh, Okay, there's a recommendation are also going to be by province because the oxygen as medication are delivered okay, through each provinces, okay, who is obviously paying its, um, each provinces through the healthcare system. Then the rule and the recommendation, the criteria might differ from one province to the other. There is one strict rule about oxygen, long-term oxygen treatment in COPD, because we have the evidence that patients that have a certain level of oxygen in their blood, and that level is less than 55 millimeter of mercury, these patients, when you give oxygen for at least 18 to 24 hours, do better, they have a long, the, increased survival than those who take 12 hour and those who tell 12 hour have a longer survival than those who don't take oxygen. And that has been established from two randomized clinical trials in the 80, the MRC trial done in UK and the NEP trial done in USA. For the oxygen and between 55 and 60, patients that have complications such as high level of red blood cell, polycythemia, or core pulmonale. There are already signs that the right art is working too hard. Let's put it that way. For night oxygen, for oxygen on exertion, okay, we have no evidence that it improves quality of life, it improves survival or reduce mortality, and therefore it gonna, it's going to get vary very much between provinces. For example, in Quebec, night uh, uh, oxygen is not okay, an indication. Uh, uh, then okay, you, you won't be able to have uh, oxygen at night isolated like that unless you respond to the criteria of long-term oxygen treatment. On exertion, we use it to train patients in pulmonary rehab. 
But the problem is that unless we can prove that symptomatically we improve the patient on exertion, we can occasionally build case of very severe COPD by showing that this patient will benefit because he can stay at home. We can prevent the patient from being hospitalized, but it is still the minority and it needs a lot of documentation right. because we don't have the evidence in, on exertion as well. Okay, that Thank is. you. I think we have one more. Thinking of your last case study of the woman uh, whose FEV1 seemed okay and had a not great look in CT scan and uh, subsequent you did some exercise testing, where does exercise testing fit in uh, in your mind now? Would you recommend it to more patients or is that still a single patient? Um, there, it, it's not in any recommendation. We're, uh, when I trained 30 years ago as, as a resident in, in respirology, uh, we were doing exercise tests much more than we, we do now, but, and things were much more complicated. To get the number on exercise tests, that, that was taking the whole morning to a technician because everything was calculated by N. Yeah, that was us, awesome. and <laughs> we were doing that all the time. It's unbelievable. <laughs> now that it's all computerized, you get the result right away. Hey. Uh, we, we don't do that, and even in the curriculum, the training, we've been moving to the imaging a lot, and we have abandoned function evaluation because the place of exercise of an exercise test is to assess the patient while you stress the patient, as opposed to your test done at rest. Then in my institution, and I obviously have a bias because I'm in Pume Rehab, I, I, I do a lot of physiology, but we have a team and that then we're doing it and I'm, I'm going to do it now systematically. And we do it systematically, all the rehab patients uh, before starting the program. Now I'm going to do it systematically in all the patients. Hopefully we can, we can build a, a series okay, and, and, and show that this might be useful. We have a very large court in Canada that I'm leading, 1,500 subjects across nine cities. They are mild subject. We, this is in the court. We're starting the study on alpha-1 and um, uh, uh, gene sequencing. Uh, we have exercise tests, incremental maximal exercise tests, and CT scan, qualitative evaluation and quantitative evaluation, and pulmonary function tests on every subject with a follow-up at three years as well that we are going to look in that study that I was talking about, we are going to look into that to see if the exercise test will have a place to allow us to detect those patients that may be missed because they had just slowed down and you don't, you, if you don't stress them in a situation then you may not find out the physiology that is already disturbed but you won't see at rest as well. Then the short answer to your question, no, maybe. maybe. <laughs> Not okay. now, maybe soon. <laughs> maybe later. <laughs> we have a question that came in uh, from someone watching uh, through our live stream. And the question is, I am a ZZ. I have PFTs every six months. FVC is 133% v one is 101 percent. Over the past seven years, diffusion capacity has dropped from 91 percent to 64 percent. Is augmentation therapy going to help stop the drop in diffusion capacity? Just, I'm going to give you a summary of what these results mean, because un unless someone in the room wants to give me the, the, the summary of that. What is the situation here? Is that over a six to seven year, the test that this patient has had show that the, the FEV1, which is the measure that many of you might understand better because you do that test, it's a forced expiratory volume in one second, okay? And that is lower then the force vital capacity. The force vital capacity, it's all the air that you exhale and that you can exhale. 
to the point that you can lose conscious if you want. That's the force vital capacity. And when you look at the ratio here of the FEV1, which is at 130% of predicted, and you look at the FEV1 that is 101%, this ratio is reduced. Therefore, there is COPD, because the definition of COPD is based on the post-bronchodilator ratio being less than 0.7. Then here, in proportion, there is a reduction of the FEV1, while the FVC is really supranormal at 130%. But the FEV1 is still above 80% of predicted, then that would be called mild COPD. The problem here, and that's what I was explaining earlier on, is the DLCO is going down. What is the DLCO? The DLCO is the diffusion capacity. And that tells us, unless she's more and more and more anemic over the year, which is unlikely to happen, and to explain the low DLCO, it tells us in a case like that, with ZZ, that, okay, she's having the lung tissue, okay, there is more destruction, emphysema. If we look, probably she's not mentioning about the CT scan. I wouldn't be surprised that her doctor has also done CT scan. She likely have on CT scan emphysema. Is it enough, this drop, to be able to say that there's been loss over the last six years in her okay, lung density from the CT scan? I'm not sure. But the DLCO is going down. And those cases are really problematic. Because if you look at the recommendation from the CTS, and again, don't blame the CTS. Guideline, question, you decide the question. You have the question. You look at the evidence. You cannot take data that doesn't exist. And you take those data, and you say, I have enough to suggest, to recommend. There is a big gap now because you have these patients that are, there is a discordance between the FEV1, the DLCO, or the emphysema on the CD scan because the DLCO is the, better, the best test to reflect emphysema. Okay? And uh, I would believe that she would probably benefit, but she, depending on which province she is, she, uh, or even private insurance, the problem of private insurance, you know what it is now. Ten years ago, okay, they were, they were going their way. Now they tend to apply the same rule that our uh, government public insurance system is putting in place. They're very wise huh, on, on this. They don't have to do the study. They don't have to take the blame. They just say, okay. And this is something that would certainly need to be looked carefully have an exercise test that would really be a good candidate okay, to push things a little bit more and, and then to see if there is something that can be done depending on which province that patient is. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Oh. Uh, hi. Uh, you, you mentioned several times why don't, why don't we get more testing done, what's going on, and, and so I'll ask you this question. Uh, COPD, people with COPD tend to be a little older, um, maybe they're ex-smokers or smokers, and, and so um, I'm, I'm going to ask if there's, you know, compared to say a group of CF, which are usually presents in kids and so on, uh, are, are the older smoker types kind of marginalized because it's your own fault, don't bother us? It, th thanks for asking the, the question. You know, we're, we're all human. Human beings, okay, have the, uh, we, we have a, a certain behavior based on what we know, our knowledge, based on our experience, based on the, uh, a lot of ignorance, okay, I would, I would say in, in, in general. Uh, and it's not only true for that. Sure, there are going to be a different sensitivity to disease that... Uh, you, you can say that the patient is not responsible because there is the notion 
of responsibility uh, here, uh, uh, where uh, you're gonna say, yeah, that poor kid uh, uh, hasn't decided, okay, and there is uh, no evidence that you need an exposure, therefore, okay, you, you, develop, uh, you develop the disease. Then the, being a kid, uh, not having an exposure, okay, that you could have a control on, it certainly, uh, uh, COPD is really much exposed to a blame in general because of the smoking. But can I remind people, that cystic fibrosis is probably not the best example, but can I remind people that chronic disease are all caused by LT, poor LT habit. And, and that, when I'm talking of chronic disease, now, worldwide, worldwide, that means you're in India, you're in China, you're in USA, you're in Europe. What are the number one disease killer? It's the non-communicable chronic disease. Okay? And most of these disease, we know the risk factor. There are many that we may not know. Alzheimer, we certainly don't know. Diabetes, we know. Are we going to blame obesity and for across, okay, and it's a huge problem across the world that are the number one cause of diabetes, high blood pressure. Cardiovascular disease are going up again. Diabetes is going up, where in the last 30 years, there have been mortality and morbidity from cardiovascular disease were going down. And now it's going up again, okay, because of poor nutrition, habit, and um, uh, inactivity. Then, you know, but we're, we're strike minus two with the COPD. And uh, when it comes to talk about alpha-1 antitrypsin, uh, we should be not strike minus something because we have a genetic disease. And let's put that up front and say that these people have the only genetic disease that we know that is a host factor for COPD. Let's change that into a positive. <laughs> Maybe that's what we need. Thank you, doctor. Thank you very much.